I was feverishly working my way through the slalom skiing exercise on Godility, and I thought, you know what? My husband's pretty good at mathematics because he has a job that uses numbers. I thought, let me run this by him and see what he thinks. Within 30 seconds, he was like, uh, no. My reasoning was, if I could get him to understand even a little bit of it, then that would tell me whether or not I was on the right track to explaining it here. After all, I am a firm believer in the KISS method, which I haven't talked about in quite a while, but back in my older videos, there was always a KISS method to writing programs. And I know it sounds so crazy, a codility exercise rated hard being easy, but it just doesn't have to be if you think about it the right way. You have to keep in mind for problems like this, it's just numbers. Now you're probably really confused by this image but I don't want you to be because in this video, I'm going to pull you out of the polar vortex and get you skiing down the bunny hills in no time. A good method for solving this exercise is to use dynamic programming, which is a valuable skill in the coding world. By gaining proficiency in this area, it demonstrates your ability to bring efficient solutions to the table like scheduling problems and route planning. And when you possess this fundamental concept, coupled with good communication skills, teamwork, and self-study, it can really set you apart and give you a higher chance at being offered your dream job. For this problem, Codility is asking us to find the longest increasing subsequence and a decreasing subsequence and then another increasing subsequence. Now there's four little words at the top of this that I almost missed, but it says that it must be done in three monotonic parts. Now if you don't know what that means, I'm really sorry to make you all upset but monotonicity is not gonna be within the scope of this video. However, I do encourage you to undertake studying what that means on your own. Back to the problem. We're gonna first start out skiing to the left, then to the right, and then to the left again. We have to do this efficiently, which is code for utilizing the best method to solving this problem. In this case, the general consensus is that DP or dynamic programming is the most efficient way to solve this. And we can use this method to find our three subsequences. Check out this image here to see the difference between a sequence and a subsequence. Now again, I don't want you to get too hung up on all this fancy language. Again, it's just numbers. So if we take our array with their index positions, knowing that, there are, that they are all unique, there are no duplicates in this array, and we sort them in ascending order, we can see their gates or their gate positions. Then when we change position or we move back, we can see our decreasing subsequence of eight and two, which is at index position seven and eight. And lastly, moving forward, again, switching direction, we see our next longest increasing subsequence of six and nine that are at the gate positions or their index positions of 10 and 11. Great, that's all fine and dandy, but how do we dynamically program a uh, program? Allow myself to introduce myself. How do we stop it at one place, switch gears, change positions, move a different way, then switch direction again, move back again? How do we do all this? That sounds like a lot of traversing, and it would be, but that's not what we're going to be doing. We're comparing, we're counting, and we're sorting dynamically. Let's take a look. We can write our program to create a new array that are all ones, the same size or same length as our original array. Then we compare each element to the right of it to see if it's bigger. If it's bigger, we count it and we continue to count it. And if it's not bigger, we just leave it alone. Thank you. 
So for our first run, we get four numbers because our longest increasing subsequence is four numbers. Now the big question becomes, how do we find the next subsequent decrease and then back once more? Well, for this tutorial, I wrote three program functions for you to look at. It's not efficient at all, but it is really readable. And it's, I think it will help you to actually see how this is going on behind the scenes. Actually, it wasn't going on behind the scenes, but maybe you can find it helpful. I assure you that by breaking it all the way down, it'll give you the tools to build it up yourself cleaner and better. Now, these three program functions that I wrote, I actually condensed into one long program and submitted it into Codility. Come along with me and watch me submit it. I have condensed the problem to be Codility ready. And I'm just going to copy it. I'm going to paste it into Codility and you're going to watch in real time my score on this. Now, I'm not anticipating that it's going to be 100%. If it gets 100%, you will literally see me have a heart attack and die in my chair. So I'm going to turn on the screen record right now. We're going to do this together. Zero percent. I wasn't expecting that. And as you can see, that was a complete and utter failure. And I had to go all the way back to the drawing board. That wasn't a lot of fun, but it was a lot of learning, especially when it comes to 1N mapping. That is the key to solving this problem, not just writing it all the way out like I did. So what does 1N mapping actually do? Well, it provides a way to define the relationship between the original sequence and a transformed sequence. The use of 1N mapping can be beneficial when there's a need to introduce constraints or variations in the longest increasing subsequence problem. It provides a way to define a relationship between the original sequence and a transformed sequence, allowing for different perspectives on the problem. By allowing at most two turns in the problem, it introduces complexity. The dynamic programming approach with a suitable mapping can handle these turns by exploring different possibilities while maintaining order. Here's how it works. So as you can see on the spreadsheet clip that I have here, if you will look in the middle column, it's taking the elements and it's going down and then counting, taking into consideration that last number at its position. And so you will see that it is actually at the very bottom, it's eight altogether. Using 1N mapping may not be considered the best way, but it is a good way. I believe, to solving the Codility Slalom Skiing. And I want you to come with me one more time and submit this new program that I've constructed and let's see if I can actually get a percentage this time. Let's go. Okay, wow. let's submit it. Uh, I've copied it from my term and I'm leaving it over here. Next, uh, Chris or Ashley. I've grown to, like, these two are, like, pretty... Let's run it. Uh, hmm. I mean, Chris is shown to have a little bit more personality than her. I mean, we, we haven't even seen that much about Ashley yet, so... Oh, no. 
thank you so much for joining me in this video. I feel like I have been beat up. Just to recap, I'm gonna be a little real here for a second. I really thought I had this problem on lock by stopping the array. I don't know if I'm even gonna be able to explain this correctly. By stopping the array and, or I should say cutting it off and making that the first turn and then continuing on through the array by calling them turns. So I had a first turn, second turn, last turn. It was a good way to show how they were wanting to solve the problem, but it really was a horrible way of solving it. It didn't work at all. And that's what finally led me to breaking down the one end mapping. And that was actually the solution to the problem. Anywho, I am not going to be putting a 100% solution on my Patreon page because I actually got 100% on my first try with the one end mapping. So I really hope you enjoyed this video and I'm going to continue on to the next section, which is the 2016 challenges through Codality. So yeah, join me for that and I'll see you soon.